So welcome to this webinar arranged by Penn USA and Right Livelihood Award Foundation with a focus on feminist foreign policy and its implications for women uh, human rights defenders. Uh, a keystone in feminist foreign policy is to protect women human rights defenders and to ensure their ability to advocate for women's rights and enhance their work environment. And by bringing together in this webinar decision makers and feminist activists, this event uh, wants to be a space to share reflections and best practices on how feminist foreign policy could substantially and concretely improve the lives of women human rights defenders. Uh, especially when they are working in repressive environments. And we are honored today to have Osa Regnier, Deputy Executive Director for UN Women with us, and also Ambassador Anna Jardfeldt, Permanent Representative of Sweden to the UN in Geneva, and MEP Hanna Neumann, who, and they, you are all strong advocates for the adoption of the EU feminist foreign policy. And we are also extremely honored to have Mohsen Hassan, uh, Doria Feminist Fund, um, director of the Doria Feminist Fund, and also a Right Livelihood Award laureate. And also to have Dr. Sima Samar, Afghanistan's former state minister. Um, and you are also Right Livelihood Award uh, laureate. And you will discuss how the feminist foreign policy could support and improve uh, the work that you are doing when you are working in um, environments like Egypt or Afghanistan with great personal risks. But you will also bring out your own experiences as well as Nasrin Sotoudeh's uh, experiences in Iran. And Nasrin is also a Right Line Award laureate and she is imprisoned. So uh, my name is Gunilla Hallonsten. I am a board member of Right Livelihood Award Foundation and director of Church and Society at Church of Sweden and I will moderate this webinar. So um, the context then for the foreign feminist policy in Sweden is that this year we are celebrating 100 years of democracy. It's 100 years ago in Sweden that women were allowed to vote and to represent in the parliament. And I will soon, uh, first I will hand over to Åsa Regnia, but soon then later to Anna Jardfeldt, who will let us know everything about the Swedish foreign feminist policy. Uh, but first I want to introduce Åsa Regnia, and you are the deputy executive director of UN Women. And you have been the previous Minister for Gender Equality in the Swedish government. And your focus uh, has always been on concrete results in the implementation of Swedish gender equality policies. And also a shift towards prevention of violence against uh, women and the involvement of men and boys in gender equality work. So, Welcome, Åsa Regnier, and we will get a video message by Åsa. Excellencies, colleagues, friends, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for your commitment to women, peace and security. In my former life, I was a cabinet minister in my home country, Sweden, where I was the Minister of Social Affairs and Gender Equality. So therefore, I know something about the Swedish feminist foreign policy as well. I think that this initiative and the feminist foreign policy as a concept has set an example to guide all interventions from the so-called 3R perspective, rights, resources, and representation in whatever is being done or initiated uh, within the Swedish foreign policy. 
I think also that Sweden has been able, together with civil society, to highlight the double exposure of women human rights defenders as both women and civil society actors, sometimes also representing minorities or other groups. So I think that the feminist foreign policy, which has since been taken up by other countries, is one example of how a government can lead and steer gender equality policies. We have also learned lessons uh, in relation to the Swedish initiative on feminist foreign policy. And one is that it is important to fund these initiatives, something I'm not sure even Sweden did at the outset enough. And this is a global trend. It's fantastic with good support and with good initiatives of this kind, but they have to also come with funding and ideas about implementation. The interest from more and more member states in the Women, Peace and Security agenda is obviously a very good thing and it drives results. Here in New York, the Security Council regularly invites women's civil society representatives to speak and brief at the Council. We can also see that language in resolutions to an always greater extent contains gender references. It is nowadays as much as 70% of the resolutions. The Security Council's informal expert group on women, peace and security, to which UN Women serves as the secretariat, offers another space for the council members to discuss issues of concern in relation to women, peace and security, including the situation of women human rights defenders. I am, and many of you are, very concerned that women human rights defenders continue and sometimes even increasingly to be targeted with threats, harassment and violence. We have also seen that lockdown measures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic have worsened existing risk for female activists. For example, on the first day of Colombia's quarantine, Carlota Isabel Salinas Perez, who dedicated her life to defending women's rights, was shot dead in front of her house. We all must contribute to a safe and enabling environment for women human rights defenders to do their work. Many times what they advocate for is actually international agreements. They're doing the UN's job. In his last report on women, peace and security, the UN Secretary General called on UN peace missions to be more attentive to signs of backlash or attacks against women activists. He also called on the international community to provide financing to organizations that channel emergency funds to women human rights defenders at risk. Many times these women's groups represent and organize women who are most targeted and with the greatest needs in dire conflict and humanitarian situations. We do have strong recommendations, commitments and obligations in place, but what we need now is action, accountability, implementation and funding. In the context of the Women, Peace and Security Compact, which in itself is a part of and an outcome of the Generation Equality Forum, I think you'll be pleased to know that there is, are also measures and initiatives in relation to protection of women rights defenders in the context of conflict. At the Generation Equality Forum in June, the compact will launch ambitious and concrete actions and proposals to support women's activists in their struggle for gender equality and peace and peace building. I hope that everything that we do, not only the compact, will support and strengthen the very important work, courageous leadership of women's rights defenders in the countries where this is so needed. 
thank you so much for having me today. And we say so much thank you to Osarengnia for sending this message forward to us. And what she asks for very explicit is action, implementation and funding. So I think that is something that we really need to bring forward also after this webinar. Uh, now I would like to introduce Ambassador Anna Jardfeldt. Um, she is the permanent representative of Sweden to the UN in Geneva. And before she was the Swedish ambassador to Kenya and to the EU's political and security committee from 2014 to 2017. And she has also spent four years as the director of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. And um, welcome Anna. And it will be so interesting to hear how you describe the Swedish foreign feminist policy. No, thank you so much, Gunilla, and thank you so much for inviting me here today. As a Swedish ambassador, I'm always delighted to speak about the uh, Swedish feminist foreign policy. It is really a cornerstone for me uh, in, my, in my daily work. As you might know, uh, in 2014, Sweden was the first country in the world to launch a feminist foreign policy. Since then, I think it's five countries now that have joined us on this, on this path. It's Canada, it's France, Luxembourg, Mexico, and then also Spain last year. The idea in 2014, it was to adopt a systematic gender equality perspective throughout our foreign policy. And the starting point, it was that gender equality itself, in itself, it is an objective, but also that this kind of policy is essential for achieving the government's overall objectives, such as peace, security and sustainable development. As ambassador, as, uh, as you mentioned, Gunilla, I have had the privilege to work with the feminist foreign policy in different capacities. I have been a negotiator in the European Union. I worked on the ground in Kenya and now as a representative to the UN here in Geneva. And during this time, I've had the opportunity to discuss this quite frequently. And uh, uh, when somebody has asked me, what is the feminist foreign policy? The quick answer is exactly as uh, uh, Osa now mentioned, it is maybe to describe it in the three R's. It is the rights for women. It is representation of women, but it's also resources made available to women. But since today I have a little bit more time, I wanted to, to speak a little bit to you about both on what the policy actually is, but also how it's executed and what kind of difference it can, it can make. So to start with what it is. In our action plan that we have adopted, uh, there are six objectives that are, uh, that are identified. In brief, they are human rights, freedom from violence, participation, resolving conflict and peace building, political participation, economic rights and empowerment, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. So these are sort of the main, uh, the main objectives of this policy. So how do we do this? Uh, I think some uh, different methods are being used. I think we can describe it as through leadership, through ownership, through support, and through building alliances. And when I mention leadership, what does this uh, mean? Um, this leadership really starts from the top. Uh, a feminist perspective is always integrated into the foreign minister's statement of government policy on foreign affairs, which is her annual speech to the parliament. But it's also raised in speeches, articles, tweets, both by our ministers, but also of all of us representing the Swedish Foreign Service. Uh, we also uh, take targeted initiatives in this area, and one of my favorite uh, uh, that I, uh, initiatives that I have been, uh, been participating in is uh, uh, a photo exhibition. Uh, it's a photo exhibition that has been wandering amongst almost all Swedish embassies in the world, and it's a photo exhibition displaying dads in different uh, fatherly roles. And uh, it is really has really been a fantastic vehicle to discuss uh, the role of fathers and of, of men, because of course we can never achieve uh, a more gender equal world if also not men take another type of role often uh, when it comes to, to the home, uh, to the home uh, area. Uh, 
But I think also when it comes to leadership, maybe the most important uh, thing that I feel personally, it is that this policy to have this behind me, I always feel as a Swedish diplomat that I can, can and should show leadership everywhere and at all times when it comes to gender equality, that I can be clear, I can be open and I can be uh, uh, consistent in the promotion of gender equality. And this personally, I feel, really enables me to, uh, to, uh, to speak up even when it can feel a little bit uncomfortable to speak up. You know how it is sometimes you feel that there is a barrier and you will sort of destroy the nice atmosphere by speaking up on these issues. But with this very clear policy behind me, I feel that it's always right for me to bring up uh, gender equality issues when so appropriate. Uh, but also another factor that we are working with a lot is that in our ministry, we really have created ownership amongst everyone when it comes to this policy. All managers in our ministry, they are responsible for ensuring that gender equality perspectives are being integrated in all operations, including in decision making and resource allocation processes. We have focal points for the feminist foreign policy at every department and at every embassy abroad. We also try to ensure that uh, we have a, a stronger gender mainstreaming, including in the form of gender budgeting when we are looking at the, at the financial allocations. And we ensure that in every project where we are participating, we have a clear distribution of responsibility for gender equality in the rules of procedure. We try to integrate this policy in our ordinary monitoring and objectives and results. And also we make sure to uh, regularly make uh, individual gender equality analysis of the different perspectives that we're working on. But I think also another very important tool is uh, that the ministry is providing us as diplomats with support. We have, theme we have a theme page on the feminist foreign policy on our, on our intranet. We, have, uh, we are bringing forward best practices and examples, sharing it between our, our different missions. We may, there are fact sheets and information material because not everyone is an expert in this area and then you have to know where to turn. But we also have a coordinator and a focal point on this, an ambassador for gender equality, who is really our sort of key person uh, to turn to when you have questions and when you want to get specific ideas. And we also have e-training and e-learning for all of our, um, all of our diplomatic st staff all around the world on these issues. So these are some of the tools that we use in, in our Swedish foreign, foreign service. But of course, we could never do this alone. And when it comes to these issues, you know how important it is to seek alliances. This can be alliances with other countries. It can be within the Nordic countries, within the EU countries. It can be trans-regional uh, alliances. But it also, of course, means alliances with civil society, with research institutions and with other actors. This is all about building, uh, building networks. So if this is a little bit on how and what this policy is, uh, of course, it has to be, as was alluded to, also accompanied with the different policy initiatives. And I can just mention a few, but I have to say that uh, gender issues in everything we do when it comes to project is a very prominent uh, feature. But what we have done, for instance, is that we have given a 35% financial increase in support of women's organizations, because we really believed that we have to have women's organizations well-funded all around the world. And I would not be surprised if we are seeing even further allocations and increases in allocations when it comes to this because this is something that is very, very important for, for our government. We have also seen now during COVID, for instance, where we see that women are the most hard, are the hardest, women and girls are the hardest, uh, hardest hit in this, uh, in this crisis. We have substantially increased our, our uh, support, including uh, to women's health and, uh, and rights issues, because we see that this has been a challenging area during the, the pandemic. But we are also trying to take initiatives such as uh, we have created and we have supported a specific uh, leadership programs for women leaders and entrepreneurs in countries like Saudi Arabia to make sure that there is also localized network and support for, for women issues. 
And I can just mention some of the, the things that we are doing here in, in Geneva. We are, of course, consistently engaging when it comes to human rights defenders in particular. We are consistently engaging with human rights defenders. We are raising uh, this issue when we are negotiating resolutions. And also myself in uh, all of the speeches we are making for the human rights sessions, you will, including for this one, you will find me mentioning at several locations, uh, specifically human rights defenders to really make sure that this is a, a strong message from, from our delegations. And then you can, of course, ask finally, what kind of difference does this make? And I think it's always very difficult to say uh, that this is a result only of the feminist foreign policy. But that's what, what I, I can say and what I can say quite confidently it is that if you do raise these issues, clearly and consistently, you can become a little bit annoying sometimes, but you actually can see results. I just remember when I was uh, in the European Union, when I started in the political and security committee, no woman had ever been a, a head of mission for an EU mission abroad. And then when I left three years later, I cannot say that it was only because of me or the feminist foreign policy, but almost half of the missions were led by women. And these are the kind of results that we have to focus on. We have to raise it and never accept that this is sort of an inequality that apparently because it's in the security uh, policy sector, we have to accept that there are no women visible and we have to raise it consistently. And I think that if you do, you can also see, see results. But of course, we're also seeing Women's uh, perspective being raised in uh, after our Security Council presence in every resolution by the by the UN Security Council. We are seeing more participation of women in peace efforts in many countries such as Mali, Colombia and, and Syria. But also, uh, and maybe finally, I want to mention that we have also in Sweden created our own female network of negotiators. And this is a, a reflection of that when we are seeing peace being made or trying to be made, the absence that we of women in these processes is really staggering. So we are both trying to promote uh, uh, Swedish female negotiators, but we are also very much promoting uh, network creation in other countries around negotiators and also trying to build uh, uh, links between these negotiating networks because women need to be around the table when peace is being made because otherwise peace will not be sustainable. So thank these you. are a few, years from, a few words from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And I also think that you actually answered some of OSA's requests on uh, funding and leadership and so forth. And I must say that when you say leadership and ownership are crucial, are key uh, in, in the uh, feminist policy, I think that is really true. And I know that Sweden has always been working on gender mainstreaming. And I think the integration that you describe is also really there now and it's, it's owned in a special way. So thank you very much. Now I would like to introduce MEP Hanna Neumann. She is a German politician who now serves as the Peace and Human Rights Coordinator for the Greens in the European Parliament, as well as Vice Chair of the Human Rights Committee. And she has previously worked as a consultant for peace projects for the UN. And she is a strong advocate for EU institutions and member states to work towards a feminist foreign policy both at the European and the national level. And I also think that you will highlight the case of Nassim Sotodeh. So welcome, Hanna. Thank you so much, Gunilla. And um, I think Anna has brilliantly explained what the feminist foreign policy means and also my own fight for the EU to adopt something like a feminist foreign policy is based a lot on the three R's um, of the Swedish and trying to see if we would consistently take that to European Union's own institutions, but also its policy decisions, what, what we need to change. But maybe also because I see my sisters in crime, Muslim and Sima here, I would actually like to just start with a totally different perspective. Because I know that you will speak, and I hope that you will speak about the tremendous work you do in Egypt and in Afghanistan, which are two countries where it's not easy to human rights work and where it's especially not easy to do feminist human rights work as a woman. 
I mean, all this coming together, my, my heart is just so full of gratitude for the work you do. And it's always a source of inspiration. And as, as someone who also works in, in these kind of projects, I, let me just share, share one thing and then I'm building it up to the feminist porn policy, no worries. Um, I was in Iraq last time two months ago and I was meeting um, some of these protesters that went to the streets and that were fighting for national elections. And many of these protesters were women, which always comes as a surprise for many in the European Union that women are now going to the streets. Well, it shouldn't, but apparently it's still challenging stereotypes. Um, and of course, as someone who is an advocate for a feminist foreign policy, when I do these visits, meeting women, also meeting women in, let's say, spaces for women only is something I make as a key objective. So I met with some of these female protesters um, who were leading the protests and I said, so who of you is running for the national elections now? I mean, you risked your life to go to the streets. You've shown us this picture of we are one Iraqi. You fought for this national election to happen. So who of you is going to run? And then they said, you know, just thinking about running means I'm losing my job. I'm having a smear campaign all over me. I have my whole family asking me, why do you do this to us? I have very little chances to actually win in the system that we have at the moment. And I may lose my life. And me as someone who then wants to do foreign policy on an with, with some empathy, I always find my, myself in the position of, so what, what do I say to, to these women? Do I say, you know, it's so important for women empowerment that you stand your claim and you walk to that, knowing that this may mean that they will die? Or do I just say, don't do it because you may die? Or do I just say, and I think that's what we should do. It's your decision. This is the risk. This is the support we can give you. But in the end, it's your decision. And I really think, and I mean, Mosul and Sima, you made this decision for yourselves. Our role then is to just protect and support all the women that walk this way. And there, if I look at the foreign policy that we do, we often fail. And we don't fail intentionally because we don't want to support women, human rights defenders or women, but because we sometimes don't take the specific context into account and use this gender lens. That's what I'm telling my male compatriots. Just don't look at it only through the economic lens or through the geopolitical lens, but let's take the gender lens and see what this means. And I'm just trying to use this gender lens now in terms of representation, resources and rights to explain what it means and what that would mean for changing our foreign policy with a more feminist angle. The first one is representation. Foreign policy still is people with badges talking to people with badges. Most of the time they're wearing black suits and ties. So if I do foreign policy with Egypt, usually I invite the Egyptian government or whoever they send as a Sherpa, knowing that they do not represent the people of Egypt and knowing that they are very male. And then the question is how big is my effort to say, yes, I need to speak with the Egyptian government because they run this country. But why can I not extend the negotiation table for another half where the people said that I actually uphold and try to find constructive, peaceful solutions for decades? Why do they have less of a right to sit at these tables? That's what Anna said in terms of women need to sit at the negotiation tables, but not just women. And if, these, if women don't have visibility and we need to spend all our project money First of all, it's often those that are apparent partners to us that we give the resources to. But in societies where men have visibility and women don't, it ends up going to the men. So my question then is how can we counterbalance that? And I often, that's why I'm so happy that we will have this Doria fund. Often I go to women and say, okay, we have this support money. And they say, how much is it? And then I say, well, if, if you can spend less than 500,000, and then they go, I don't need that much money. Whereas the guys often go, yeah, well, no problem. I can do whatever kind of phantom castle that will never see the light of the day. 
So that's also something the way our administration works and this funding works means that we are once again discriminating women. And then I'm, I'm just going to say one on the rights and the social practices, because I know there's a lot of problems with women rights. Um, but just one where I think, I mean, one thing is to tell the Afghani government or the Egyptian government they need to get away with these rights or they need to do something better. That's a very long call. The other one is what do we? How do we one lead by example? If there is no EU delegation ever headed by a, by a woman, I mean, what example do we set for women empowerment? But the other one is what do our policies actually do? Sometimes unintentionally. And for me, one of the biggest concerns I have at the moment, and I know it has a big impact on many women human rights defenders, is our visa policy. 90 days Schengen visa. I'm not speaking about political asylum. I'm just speaking about 90 days Schengen visas to go to a conference, to go to a conference, to do some networking, or to get out for one or two weeks when it gets too hot. We have a visa handbook, and the agencies that do our visa process run this handbook by the book. That says, to get a visa, you should not be in conflict with state authorities. You should not have been in prison. You should be married because that makes you more likely to go back. You should have a regular income and you should have a proper job. These five things, by definition, rule out human rights defenders in the countries where the human rights situation is a disaster. So that's what I'm, and that's something we have 100% power to change. And that's where I'm even more frustrated than with other governments that we cannot get our grips on that one and change that one. So I really think, as Asa said, we have written enough papers and action plans and stuff. We really need to act and we need to act consistently. And in this action, always ask ourselves, what does it mean for the discrimination women and of LGBTI if we do these projects, even unintentionally. And well, there will be a round of questions, so maybe I just leave it there. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. And thank you for bringing both your um, engagement and heart into the promotion for foreign feminist policy, and also for highlighting the, the challenges that the women human rights defenders um, that they meet, for example, in uh, applying for, for visa. And that's not something that we often discuss, but I think that is actually important. Now I would like to introduce Mohsen Hassan, um, uh, director of the Doria Feminist Fund and Right Livelihood Award laureate. She is an Egyptian feminist and founder of the organization Nasrat for Feminist Studies, who received the award in 2016 for asserting the equality and rights of women in circumstances where they are subject to ongoing violence, abuse, and discrimination. And um, convinced that feminism and gender equality are political and social issues affecting the freedom and development of all societies. The organization is working towards an increased capacity within the feminist movements in Egypt. And Mohsen Hassan is also the founder of then the Doria Feminist Fund. And I welcome you and I'm really looking forward to, to hear your, your speech, Mohsen. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really, really, really extremely privileged to be in this event and also all the time I'm really happy and I think I'm so lucky that I know Hannah personally and I had this discussion and this feminist solidarity all the time because it's not something easy to find people who can understand what's happening within the dynamics and other things. And while you were speaking, I was so, so nervous the last days. And while you are speaking, I felt like so intimidated that who I am to speak and sit with all those people who are well known and have positions, but at the same time who are speaking about this sophisticated gender and feminist policies and other things. But honestly, while you are speaking, I was thinking that our existence is important. 
our existing is important because it's really hard to set norms and policies for your foreign policies without listening to us and without understanding what's happening in our countries and contexts and really about the stereotypes all the time about feminists. So I can clearly say that I'm coming from a region which has lots of people who are speaking about it and on it, but almost less voices coming from this region and and lots of resources are coming to this region and most of the time the resources are claiming that they are for us but with all these stereotypes about us this is something so clear and has been clear and clear in the last 10 years while Hannah has been speaking about what's happening in Iraq we had this 10 years ago we had it when everyone was surprised that there are Egyptian women in the public sphere. And honestly, and it's not about being, I'm not a nationalist by any way, but at the same time, we are coming from a region which has this heritage of the existence of women in the public sphere and in the political sphere and being feminist. This is also something about the stereotypes all the time about us. That is something westernized, it's impossible to have feminists within this context. And if those are existing, so they are not real, are not coming from this region and this context. And honestly, it is happening. And there is a big feminist movement and struggling all the time in this region. But to tell you what's the problem, that we don't have a real solidarity on it. The solidarity is coming most of the time either to persons or also by supporting the conservative perspectives, not other feminist and progressive perspectives. And I think I am lucky personally, and Nazra was lucky that there are people like like Rai Yehud gave us our their award because it was this highlight that the work of those people is important. And from this time and before, because we have been struggling all the, on all these things, we decided to put this money as a beginning of having Dorea Feminist Fund. Because if we want to have voices from the region, it has to come from the region, but at the same time within this constructive system that those women gender, ideas and gender uh, identities receive to have deserve to have these voices within the region so this fund mainly is about facilitating this facilitating that people like us will not never be existing and sitting with you without having other solidarity so this fund is about this that is the first fund collectively from the region and talking about different countries in the region, but also it is about highlighting those who are not coming from the well-known people, even within our region, because it is also so complicated. People who have lack in language, people who don't have, if they want to be feminist and existing in their places have to understand how international politics is going, how the international development uh, tools, how also these technicalities about writing proposals and theory of change, and all these big, big, big words, which can take from their local activism on it. It's also about the narrative because we are really struggling of how internationally people are seeing us and how it's affecting our daily lives. And because of that, Dorea is focusing really on the production of knowledge to give the resources and the spaces for those people who are coming from the region and speaking on the feminist movement to produce their work. And also it is about this space of sharing, discussing, and also translating all these things and having the accessibility of this language 
barriers, but also to see what's production of knowledge. The production of knowledge is not only about academics. We are producing knowledge. It couldn't be like what people have been seeing knowledge, but feminists all the time, even by their stories, are are producing knowledge. So based on all of these things, we decided that, and it's not only me, it's a collective work, and some of my colleagues who are joining me in this crazy thing is happy, are attending our event today. And this is about having this. The fund is the space for those people to exist and to mentor those people to be able to sit and speak with you, not only to have one voice from this region. And thank you. I'm sorry I spoke too much. No, no, you didn't. Thank you very much, Mohsen. And uh, I really think that the importance, what you, when you, uh, when you uh, tell us that the voice is from the region, needs to come from the region. I think it's extremely important, but also when you highlight the importance of the narrative and of the knowledge production. So thank you for highlighting those, those things, Mohsan. And now I would like to introduce uh, Sima Samar. Uh, she's a medical doctor for the exposed and an educator for the marginalized a women human rights defender in Afghanistan. And Dr. Samar founded the Shushada organization in 89, which in 2012 operated more than 100 schools and 15 clinics and hospitals dedicated to providing education and healthcare with a focus on women and girls in Afghanistan. And Dr. Samas also established the nonprofit Gawai Shad Institute of Higher Education. And she has served in the transitory administration of Afghanistan as the first minister for women's affairs and as the UN special rapporteur for the situation of human rights in Sudan. And Dr. Samar also held a chair within the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission and is former special envoy and state minister for human rights and international relations in Afghanistan. And she was in 2012 awarded the Right Livelihood Award for her long standing and courageous dedication to human rights, especially the rights of women in one of the most complex and dangerous regions in the world. I just had to take all the presentations, Sima, because I'm so impressed and we should all know uh, the work that you are doing. So please, Sima. Uh, thank you very much and good, more, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, it's a really pleasure to be part of this discussion. Uh, I think uh, as uh, the ambassador and the, the deputy uh, to the UN woman, um, I was lucky to, to meet her when she was in the in her previous position uh, in Sweden. Uh, but in 2014, when the Sweden announced this uh, feminist foreign policy, uh, I was so happy because I had an interview with the Swedish radio and I said, this is really courageous and brave action. Uh, that is one part, of course. I'm glad that the other five countries joined in the same policy. But even on that time, I insist that this feminist foreign policy should have an impact in the ground for women in different parts of the world. Because uh, uh, with their work and their activities uh, in countries such as Afghanistan. Uh, so what I would like to say that uh, Unfortunately, currently we are, uh, we are in, a, in, in a very difficult uh, time and a crossroad. Uh, we are mourning the killing of three journal female journalists yesterday in one of the, uh, in one of the town uh, in Jalalabad. And then we also uh, had another female medical doctor who was killed today, this morning. Of course, they killed a lot of other people killed eight other people uh, working as simple labor as civilians uh, because of their ethnicity and because of their uh, belief. So Afghanistan is not an easy country 
safety for everyone, but particularly for women and um, for ra radical women such as uh, as a, as a feminist, I would say. So I think on the on the three R, I would say that of course it's all right, and nobody uh, do a kindness to us or a favor to us, but it is all right to be to have a full participation. Unfortunately, this is not the case in my country. Uh, as you know that the peace process is going on in Afghanistan and the uh, American envoy al Michael Zot was uh, appointed by previous administration, but uh, I think he, he will continues with the current administration, even being uh, a representative by the Democrat uh, government or administration from US, he came to Afghanistan three, four days ago. He had meetings in meetings with all the men in the country and particularly with the warlords. And then yesterday morning, he had a meeting uh, with the others. He had a meeting face to face, but with few of us, three women, including myself, it was a Zoom meeting for an hour, hour, 20 minutes. So he spoke what their policy would be for Afghanistan. So, and then uh, he asked me to speak because we know each other from 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, and I said, I will start with criticism because you're, you had a meeting the whole, you spent the whole two days meeting with the different warlords and different people, men, politician, but you have only one hour with us, with women. So I request a woman uh, to have another meeting with a, um, more women or broader uh, spectrum of women from different uh, field. And he promised. So today I told the ladies, I said, he promised yesterday that he's going to see, but he's not going to see it because it's, we saw always the empty promises. So why don't you protest? So they wrote a letter um, accusing him or um, criticizing him for not seeing women. Uh, the, these are the small activities, but we, we need more, uh, more action. Uh, the, on the resources, I have to say, yes, unfortunately, even in the EU, we had a meeting uh, in Brussels in 2016, I think, on Afghanistan or 2018. It was last year also. Um, last year was in Geneva, but the year before was in Brussels. But it was women's rights what was a side event. And then when we came back to Kabul, the EU ambassador in Kabul had, a, a, had another a small conference um, talking about women's rights and women inclusion and the side event in, in Brussels. So I said, thank you very much for, for raising this issue and including women on the program, but we should not be on the side event. We should be in the event, inside the event rather than side event. Uh, he didn't like my comment, but I, I made it because we need to, to say these things in order to impose our opinion and impose ourselves on them. And you know that in Afghanistan, they always use the excuse of respecting the culture and respecting the, the religion in this country and uh, the tradition of Afghanistan not to touch these issues. Uh, so on the, on the resources, I think um, what Sweden can do and should do, although they, they do, but it's not enough. I don't think it's a, it's, it should be at least 50% of their uh, um, resources or funds should go to the women programs. It doesn't mean to have always a female head of the, uh, the program, but even some, uh, some NGOs who was headed by, by men, when they do something for uh, some work for women or empowerment, uh, economical empowerment or something for men, they should be funded. And then they should be monitored that they really implement the feminist foreign policy or they only use try to use women as a as a tool in order to reach to the funding. So that is also another advice to 
Uh, on the representation, unfortunately, we have, as you, as you know, that we had this uh, uh, talks between the um, Afghan government and Taliban um, on 29th of last year, 2020, uh, Americans and Taliban uh, signed uh, an agreement between them. It is four pages. It is four, uh, four issues. Uh, release of the uh, prisoners, uh, the Taliban would uh, reduce reduce the violence, not ceasefire, but reduce the violence. In fact, they increased the violence since then. Uh, and also uh, the withdrawal of the American troops from Afghanistan and uh, intra-Afghan dialogue. Uh, in the fourth page, you don't find the word woman. It means that Afghanistan is only men and Taliban. And no word of human rights. And then we, we were discussing that the, the, the other day when it was the um, anniversary, the first anniversary of the American and Taliban intra um, our agreement. And one of the, the people, he's an Afghan, but American, he was saying that human rights and women's rights is Afghanistan's issue. And I said, no, it's not Afghanistan's issue. It should be discussed among Afghanistan, uh, Afghans. And I said, when the American came with their troops, they came to protect human rights and women's rights in the country. Why it's disappeared from the agenda now? Did, or we achieved the, our goal. So this kind of excuse is always used in order to isolate women and, uh, and issues of human rights. Uh, so that is also the, uh, when it comes to representation, I think it's really important to have women, not to make the, the gathering or the table colorful, but to make a real representation of women. That's why I'm saying that we don't always only need a female physical female body, which is also good. But we need a feminist to represent. So this is, uh, this is always a problem in Afghanistan. I mean, we, you can see in a very small things, I was discussing with the, I was criticizing the American again, because they built a, um, a highway between the two provinces, between a, Kabul and Kandahar, which is which was eight hundred million dollar. It, it is six hour drive or five hour if you if it's if it's better. And now it's broken also. No single toilet was built. We all know that the men when they need. I mean, we cannot offer kidneys not to work, but the men can go everywhere. Women cannot go everywhere. It is also same in Sweden. I think it's in EU, it's in, in anywhere. So I said, why don't you put, when you make a decision, when you work on this uh, development project, why don't you put some women in those policy making or planning? Because at least they would realize that we need. I mean, in Kabul city, we have 6 million people. In the town, you cannot find a single toilet for female. There's no toilet for the men as well. But we have a, um, a riverbed, which is used by men as a, as a toilet, but there's no female toilet. These are simple, single things. I mean, if you need to go for shopping, uh, in the morning, you should not drink anything because you don't need, you don't have a place. It is not like the other countries that the, in the shopping mall, there's a, there's a toilet. There's no toilet in the shopping mall as well. So these are this, the things that we need to realize, to, uh, to talk about it and to acknowledge that these problems are existing. Unless we acknowledge the problem, we cannot find a solution for that. I'm sorry I spoke too much and I no, think we don't fine. have enough time. Thank you. And Thank you. I, it is a real pleasure to be among our feminist sisters around Thank the world. You. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to, to listen to you, Sima. And I think what you challenge uh, uh, Sweden with is that 50% of the resources should go to 
to women programs and be monitored according to the foreign feminist policy. I think that's really a, a good challenge. There is one question that I would like to raise into uh, the panel. Um, when it comes to grassroots feminists in prison for the work, such as Nasrin Sotodeh in Iran, what tools can then a foreign policy give to pressure the state for their freedom? Maybe it's Anna who, who could say something, but I will leave it open to you. You only have like one minute to answer the question because then we will close up the session. Who is willing to say something? Sima. Can I suggest to the respected Swedish ambassador in Geneva to please speak with the um, Iranian ambassador about Nasrin? I was in Iran two weeks ago and I raised this issue of uh, Nasrin uh, with the consultation of her husband because I had to get the permission not to do harm rather than helping her. Uh, with the so-called vice president for family, a lady, uh, somebody called Masuma Tekar. Uh, and she promised that she's going to help, but she did say that, you know, that we also have a limitation and problems within our, our government. Thank you. Thank you, Sima. This was really um, um, very, very good news that you had that possibility. And Hannah, please, with the EU. Yeah, please. This is really uh, a message that we send forward. About we just had, I think, um, two months ago, an urgency resolution on Iran, including the case of Nasrin Sotoudeh, where we tried to put pressure additionally, because she doesn't only have the Right Livelihood Award, she also has um, our Sakharov Prize um, Award of the European Parliament. Yes. So we, we are very carefully um, working on that one, but we know also that the Iranian regime is not an easy one to deal with. <laughs> And any other comments or? Maybe I can say something uh, briefly, um, but just uh, I, just to emphasize, I am diplomat and uh, the decisions uh, uh, that I, on what I make or what I do is of course taken by the, by the political leadership in, in Sweden. But every time when it comes to these kind of issues, there is an individual case by case assessment uh, that, is, uh, that is being made back in, in Stockholm. Sometimes it can be very helpful to speak out. Sometimes you have to, to do this and have quiet diplomacy and uh, there is always a very, very close monitoring of the cases that we are following actively, which is quite a number of cases. And uh, the assessment is made back in Stockholm on whether or not this is the time to speak out or, or if this is the time to use kind of back, back channels to try to promote, of course, the, 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 a, positive, a positive outcome. But I also wanted just to say that I think that the other side to this is also that uh, speaking about these issues and normalizing uh, these issues and normalizing the right for women to speak up is in itself also something that can affect and influence uh, different situations. So I think it's a multifaceted uh, approach. It's probably not a very direct uh, answer that you were, you were looking for, but I do think that you have to be very, very careful when you make assessments uh, about people's lives and make sure that you're doing this in the best and the most effective way to end up with a positive result. Thank you, Anna. But it's also important that you say these things and that you explain it. So thank you. And then I also interpret you as if this is something that you are actually looking into and monitoring in, in the best way you can and assessing. And yeah. also, you would like to... Yes. yes, I just I just wish that Nazrin with us now to yeah. see how, how this solidarity and respect for her work, but at the same time, as from my positionality as a woman human rights defenders working on the issue of women human rights defenders and to relate it to the feminist foreign policy, it's also there is something called prevention from the beginning that in order not to enter that it is, is it about one case or not, uh, or the whole case, it's also something it's important I do think this for all who are carrying foreign feminist policies or putting women's rights on their agendas from the beginning to speak to the government that from the beginning it's not under negotiation that you are targeting 
women and feminists because they are doing feminist work. This is one of the things can help many of us not to be jailed or have these harsh things because mm -hmm. our space is, is not inside the jail. Our space is outside to work with other women and working on these issues. And thank you. Thank you, Mohsen, uh, so much. And you yourself know all about this. So thank you for sharing that. Now we will ask Christina Lunds, Executive Director at Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, to give a closing remark. Welcome, Christina. Hello. Um, such a huge honor. Thank you to have me. Um, I'd like to start with words by the poet, feminist poet Rupi Kaur, who says, I'm not interested in a feminism that thinks simply placing women at the top of oppressive systems is progress. And this oppressive system is patriarchy, which all over the world we've been living in for 4,000 to 6,000 years. And it's based on oppressing women and all other political minorities and sustaining this hierarchy and oppression by violence. And this violence in most cases is carried out by weapons that are delivered around the world by countries like mine, Germany. That's the reason why in 1915, um, already in The Hague, more than 1,000 feminists came together to demand not only an end to the First World War, but also um, set out resolutions that would prevent any other war. And for them, universal disarmament was the most important demand, which is why that was at the heart of those activists fighting for the women, peace and security agenda. But once it was brought into the Security Council, um, the universal disarmament and the prevention of conflict was um, eradicated and the, um, and the agenda has been co-opted. Um, so, and in fact, talking about women human rights defenders and them being able to do their work effectively, the stats look huge, like they look very dire. Um, so the median budget, and we've been talking about financing quite a bit, the median budget of a feminist organization is 20K US dollars per year. And the situation is even worse for trans, sex worker, or young feminist organizations, especially those in the global south, which have a median budget of less than 12,000 US dollars per year. And as mm -hmm. The Guardian reported last year, only 1% of all gender-focused aid went to women's grassroots organizations in 2016 to 2017. Um, and this year, this is our experience that I'm sharing now. Um, it also has to do with classes and why most of the gender focused aid is mainly going to international agencies working on women's rights instead of those feminist grassroots organizations on the ground. And for example, when my feminist organization, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, and that's an experience shared by feminist organizations all over the world, when we apply for funds to governments, for example, we have to justify the, the fair wage that we want to pay our employees all the time and to a degree that is really disrespectful towards our organization when at the same time employees in international organizations and um, in, in governments working on women's rights earn a multiple of those feminist organizations on the ground even ask for. Um, when at the same time it's studies that have shown that it's feminist grassroots organizations that are most effective in driving change um, by building networks and establishing, and establishing trust on the ground. And it is the situation is especially dire because the, 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 the other side, and uh, here's the example of those attacking women's rights globally, um, they are funded extremely well. Um, so over the last 13 years, for example, 28 US Christian right-wing groups alone, um, and many of them with ties to the former Trump administration, have spent at least $280 million to influence foreign laws, policies, and public opinion against the rights of women, women human rights defenders, and LGBTQI people outside of the US. So I hope that those statistics that show again what you, all of you shared before, the urgency of what we're talking about and why we urgently really need to bring transformative, radical feminist thinking into international policy. And it is, and it can only be driven by feminist grassroots organizations. Thank you, Christina, for this closing remark. And thank you 
all you uh, awesome, amazing uh, panelists, and thank you all the participants in this webinar. And uh, we had so much to say, and we didn't allow for any questions. And and I I hope still you found it to be interesting. And I say thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.